amazing thing. I know there's a few of us here, but soon these halls will be packed on Tuesday nights. Trust me on this one. We're trying to work out the kinks. We don't know how to do this. But the idea is brilliant, Yes. if I do say so myself. The idea is unstoppable. So you just have to hang with us while we figure out how to make it all happen. We have to work out the kinks. Right. Um, I'm so pleased that you guys have come here for Mary Lou. We'll call her Pastorel, but we know Pastorel. it's Pastorel, but it's just Mary Lou. Cassini? Right. No? Cassini, me Cassini. Yeah. This is our inaugural event. Right. Our right. inaugural Ooh. event. And Mary Lou is going to do this one again because it's going to be popular. Right. But um, she's going to talk about the Cafe Espresso, which we all know is the... Uh, Kelsey Woodstock, you know, the Woodstock Center for Photography now. Shame, shame. Yes, I agree. Right? But anyway, I just want to thank you all for coming, and I'm so happy you're here, and I really feel like this is going to be huge if you just wait, if you just hang on. Right. So, thanks for coming, be well, and let's hear the girls. Let's hear what she's got to say. Well, what I have to say is, first of all, thank you very much, Barry. I'm glad you're doing this, and I agree with you. It's bigger than life, and it's just the beginning, and uh, you have to start somewhere. So uh, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm Mary Lou. She already introduced me, and I happen to be in a restaurant that my daughter and son-in-law own. So they're carrying on the tradition of, uh, of uh, Mary Lou Pacharel in Woodstock because my first place was the Cafe Espresso where the photography center is now. And then after that, I went to uh, the, uh, where the Gypsy Wolf Cantina is, and that was Country Pie. It was a pizza place, and that was for a year. And then I moved up a little further and went to the Bear Cafe back in the 70s, from 1970 to 1979. The Bear Cafe was uh, Bernard and I ran it. And Eric, Eric Mann, who is now the chef of the Bear Cafe, was the dishwasher, and he he went from dishwasher quick to short order, and before you know it, he's uh, now the chef at the Bear Cafe, and Peter Cantine was the bartender. And I think they're doing an incredible job. They're very, uh, they're, the food is excellent, and they've been there a long time now, so I'm very proud of both of them, and and proud that uh, that they were working for me and went on to bigger things. And then after that, I went to the pot, I went to the city after the cafe. 1979, we closed the Bear Cafe, and I went to the city down on St. Mark's Place and opened a restaurant called Sandra's Restaurant. And then I came back. Did you know the place? Did you really? That was me and my and, uh, old friend. And then I came back and did the Pinecrest, Mary Lou's Restaurant, for a while. And then I did a lot of, you know, restaurant consulting. And uh, so I'm very happy to be here in this space with my daughter and son-in-law running a restaurant, doing a good job. They have Yum Yum across the street. And uh, here they're opening another place in Kingston. God bless them. I'm tired of restaurants, so I'm happy that they're doing it. But I want to mention this table, this table here, uh, which is made of one piece of uh, uh, Peruvian mahogany. Anybody who knows, uh, well, you know my bird. Well, his brother, this is John Berg, his brother who died a few years ago, uh, did this table, carved this table out, and we had it at the Bear Cafe. It was called Table Four. And we used to serve when there were like big uh, fest uh, feasts. Uh, we'd have a rack of lamb. There's a dripping spot, and we'd put a can under the drip, and people would literally eat, eat off the bowls. We had bowls put in there. It's a medieval table that in the old days you ate out of the wood and then you hose it down. No dishwashing, no, uh, and that's kind of cool. So it's it's kind of nice that there it was at the Bear Cafe and now it's here at the Oriel 9. So uh, I'm just going to ask you, since whoever is here, what would you like to, you know, is there something in particular you'd like to know or hear about, or should I just go on babbling? <laughs> babble, babble, babble. <laughs> I babbled two hours just recently, uh, so I'm sure I can babble uh, a little more. But is there anything That's in particular why I'm here. anybody wants to know or that you, what do you want to know? 
You were talking about the evolution of rock music from classical music, that Woodstock before the 60s had uh, musicians. Right. I thought that was fascinating. Well, it is true. You know, music came, music as we know it, rock and roll and Dylan, and uh, came in the 60s. But prior to that, we have the Maverick concerts, which are, uh, you know, you know, in Maverick. And that's the oldest concert, right. outdoor concert hall in the country. Right. And he, we have it right here. And I don't keep up with it. I did, you know. But, I mean, we have very famous people coming through uh, Maverick. Uh, there's a lot of famous people and talented people in Woodstock, by the way. They're just not interested in going out in the world and uh, being famous out there because it's the price you pay for that. But that's true. We did have we did have music. In fact, at the Espresso, we only played classical music. Bernard was a classical uh, music, uh, and uh, most of the time it was Vivaldi. Come in, and uh, I'll give you one short story that uh, that Dylan came in from Kingston. He had bought a few uh, of those 45s, and they were rock and roll. And he comes in, he's all excited because they're new records he just got. And he asks Bernard if he could play it. We had a really super stereo sound, and he asked Bernard if he could play the records on the uh, on the uh, at the cafe. And Bernard said no. <laughs> and Dylan, like, kind of like was taken aback because nobody says no to Dylan. They don't want to say no. You want to please him, say yes, anything you want. Um, and then he he kind of like took a. And went, no, and oh, oh, that's cool. Like he kind of liked that somebody said no to him. It was like, wow, that must have been a first. It looked like it was a first, the way his expression was. So, uh, did Bernard feel you could digest food better with classical? Say it again. Did Bernard feel that classical music was better for a restaurant? For, for it Probably, food? yeah, better for your soul, for your. Uh, I think it is personally. <laughs> On a general overall, I mean, if I had to be stuck on an island and I had a choice between Vivaldi and some rock, I think I probably would go for Vivaldi, if that's all that I was going to have to listen to. So that's just my personal, but I'm sure that these young people would say, Vivaldi, oh my God, that's like hell, and they'd want the rock, but, you know, to each his own. But the times they are are changing, aren't they? <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, back in the 60s when the town only had 3,000 people, and it was very quiet, and the summers were incredibly packed. I mean, the summers were busier than they are now, back in the 60s, only because it was a 10-week segment. That was it. It started the 4th of July, and it went to Labor Day. That was it, not Memorial Day, not after Labor Day. After Labor Day, you knew everybody went home. <laughs> And they were out till 12 o'clock at night, walking the streets. And they were out late because we did have the playhouse. And, and uh, at the Espresso, we would gear up to the playhouse, 10 o'clock. We'd gear ourselves up because you would get this crowd from the playhouse. The lines to go into the Espresso were from this, where the photography center is now, up until uh, Joshua's. That's how long the lines were. So it was intense, and it was 10 weeks of intense, lots of money making, lots of crowds. and. And then it was <laughs> silence until the next 4th of July. <laughs> so sitting around the table and wondering what are we going to do, nobody, you know, half a dozen people coming in and there's nothing happening. We talked about having folk music, and that's how the folk music came about at the Espresso, was to have some entertainment on the weekends, and maybe that would stimulate business. And we did. We did. We had uh, the first entertainers with Daniel and the Deacon, and then uh, we just kept having it until the following year. Ian was one of our one of twelve customers at the Espresso back in the '60s, and she was into theater, so she wanted to form a theater and wanted to have theater. And so we said, why not? Let's have some plays. You know, we have folk music now. Let's have some bring some plays in and uh, have some plays at the cafe. And sure enough, I'm going to let her speak about it. The first play that they did was the uh, lesson, the UNESCO, the lesson with uh, Alex Osina and uh, Chris Avanya. And, uh, and it was very successful. And people, Woodstock loved the fact that there was now something happening. And, uh, and they did support us, and they came through the winter, and, the, and we were always packed when the play was on. And, uh, and let, I'm going to put the floor to Edith and let her talk a little bit about uh, 
performing arts. I'd just like to say that I'm hoping that Woodstock University does the same thing, along with the revitalization of the Woodstock Playhouse, which is happening now, Yeah. Um, which exciting. is exciting. Yes, it is. But I'm thinking that this will be the same kind of thing. Like, we'll get people out and about. They'll be out till 9.30 at night. They'll be spending money in the dead of winter. And I hope it works that way. Edith. Yes. You got the floor, lady. Thank you. Anyway, uh, as you hear, my name is Edie Fever. That's how I know me. I co-founded Performing Arts of Woodstock. Our first show was INSO's The Lesson Done at the Cafe Espresso. It was so successful. We had such a fantastic review by Holly Bai, who was a playwright, writer, teacher, etc that it helped us launch this theater. We had contemplated doing Lorca's, uh, the, the house of Bernardo Alba. We rehearsed in the living rooms, dining rooms, garages, and we were looking for a place to perform. Nothing, nothing opened up except the Cafe Espresso. And the reason that we were launched is really because Mary Lou and Bernard let us be in there. Uh, I co-founded this animal in 1964 when we incorporated, and I did so with Ida Christ. Ida Christ was an actress and also a founder of the Pittsburgh Laboratory Theater, so she was very helpful. Uh, we performed at the Espresso, we performed elsewhere, and I wanted to let you know, because it's kind of fun, I have small shots of the lesson I guess you'd have to come up here to see it. We rehearsed the lesson interminably. Why? Because Alex Osina was a radio man, and as a radio man, he kept telling me, my mind goes too fast, I cannot memorize lines. I said, you have to. We're going to do this, not as a reading. We're going to do it full-fledged. Nothing helped. I gave him candy. I laid him down to rest. I patted him on the head. He had hair then? I don't know. At any rate, nothing worked. And since the lesson is about a lesson with a professor and a student, we decided to do it as a fantastic reading. He was the professor with his book. Gloria Krisomania was the student, and she was shy, so she had hair that went like this. But after a while, she pushed it aside. Ida Christ was in it as well. And finally, as a reading, it was so successful, and we had such a great review, that from there on, we got launched. And we incorporated, and we are now on our 151st production. We are out of the town hall because it's... <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here, too. Uh, um, the town hall is being renovated, which is very difficult for us. It has been our home for over 40 years. We want to go back there. I hope we can trust what they have said, that we can go back there and coexist with the court. I hope that's true. In the meantime, we're working on a play called Lucy, L-U-C-Y, by Damien Atkins, directed by Sharon Breslow. Anybody know Sharon? Yes, you know Sharon. At any rate, we will be performing it in the hall of the A-frame church. The A-frame church is St. Gregory's Episcopal Church on Route 212. They have a hall, and what's really funny and interesting is that they have started a garden for autistic children and people. They need more funding, and so they are going to do a benefit of for Lucy on November 4, and hopefully people will come in droves and help them have a nice autistic garden, as I call it. At any rate, uh, in our 48th season, we hope to also do a, um, it's kind of like a review. Audrey Rappaport featuring a fellow she works with called James Judd. And that would be at the kind of James Gallery, probably the end of January. And possibly in the spring, Tennessee Williams' Outcry, a play that he revised many, many times. And they say that it was his preferred play, that he felt that it was his best play. So hopefully we can carry on in that way. If, when you get a chance, you want to look at some of the photographs, uh, this is Alex Osina. And I can show you a few others 
it will remind me of what we did early, very early on at the Clangers Gallery. We did the journey from Camden to Trenton or something like that, and people, local people, were in it, including Jonathan Hubble, who, whose family was in Woodstock for a long time. Uh, this funny little thing is Spoon River Anthology, which we did. At any rate, let me go through a few of these. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, I don't know if people remember these folks. Sarah Mulligan was an actress, worked at the Playhouse, was with PW at the very, very beginning. And uh, this is from, hmm, I don't remember. At any rate, the fellow next to her has done a lot of work with us too, Larry Shufa. And then, oh, this is a very important lady, Joe Chalmers. Joe Chalmers, professional ingenue actress on Broadway, was a member of the PAW Board of Directors, did a lot of acting, and also did a great job directing, I shall show you maybe, uh, here, one shot. She did Three Men on a Horse. I don't know if you can see this well enough, but Three Men on a Horse, beautifully directed by Joe Jones. Okay. She's also an Olympic uh, swimmer. Yes, she was. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, outstanding swimmer. swimmer. Yeah, I have a question. Olympic, yes. Ba getting back to the espresso, we're all familiar now, this is all before my time, but we're all familiar now with the structure of the building of the what is now the Photography Center of Woodstock, or whatever you call it, Center for Photography at Woodstock. Woodstock. But when PAW, the Performing Arts of Woodstock, was getting started, and the place was a you know, it was in a restaurant establishment, cafe, where in the building okay. were, did, did this happen? Did it happen? Oh, it happened. When you walk inside now, it, well, did, was it on the left or the right? Well, or upstairs, it, was, or? it was an extremely family-like, cozy, warm, wonderful atmosphere. Uh, there was the kitchen, but there was also a round table, which was called the family table, to my recollection, and that's where Bob Dylan would sit. And I didn't pay much attention. He also played the piano every once in a while. Okay. As you entered the Cafe Espresso, okay. it was to your right. And some platforms were set up so that we could do this reading. That's what we cool. Okay. And then the platform was still big car It was, right? yeah, it was, no, it, no, it had a fireplace. It was at the right. The stage was set up at the right. As you walked in at the right, the stage was set at the right. And as you walked in, uh, first of all, you went down the steps and there was a fountain on the uh, patio, and the, and the patio was bluestone. And uh, then you walked in and were on the right, but it had a it had a stove pipe that went up into the room that's what heated up the room that we lived in. And and the stove pipe came down and there was a stone fireplace you could sit around it. And that fireplace was always going in winter and it was very inviting. And she talks about the family table and people today say to me, uh, well, you know, you had to be somebody, you know, to sit at the family table. That wasn't true at all. You could be anybody. You could come and sit there, even if Dylan was there. There was no, like, don't sit there. That's you probably didn't. why he sat there. Yeah, well, you could sit there as long as you didn't, yeah, as long as you weren't obnoxious. I mean, that goes for anybody anywhere, right? You didn't throw food. So the table was not... It was only the perception of people who thought it was a snobby table because they felt funny coming to sit there. But you could anybody was invited to join the table. And, uh, but it was cozy, and uh, most of the time it was filled. And yeah, he was there a lot, and uh, and he lived with us for uh, about three or four months. Uh, he he was staying with Albert, but I guess there was a lot happening at Albert's and. Uh, and he needed that space and quiet, and uh, and Bernard took very good care of him. That's my husband, who uh, who I think Dylan looked up to him as a father figure, and uh, and so uh, yeah, it was comfortable to live upstairs and get fed, come down and have a cappuccino or a glass of wine. Or, Did Albert ever come know. to the? Albert came all the time. Yeah, oh. Albert was there all the time as well. Everybody was there, it seemed, all the time. I mean, Dylan and Joan Baez and Mimi Baez and uh, and uh, Mimi Barina, rather, because she was married to Richard Barina. And I don't know how, how well you know Richard Barina, but, I mean, he was an incredible musician and, and 
he certainly left us too early. I mean, he on the night of his uh, book signing for, uh, I love the title, it's been down so long, it looks like up to me. And what a musician and songwriter, incredible. I'm sure that they all kind of, you know, huddled around uh, Richard. And then he takes off with a friend uh, on the, the day he's doing the book signing and doesn't come back. And that was, you know, that was Richard Farina. And Mimi Farina, too. She died just, uh, I don't know how many years ago of cancer. And she was a sweetheart and a beauty and just a delight and just charming. And who were some of the other great voice also. Who were some of the other performers that you had in the early days? Well, the, it's funny, I have, happen to have the list right here. Okay. I made a list, and okay. I, this is not a full list, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just run down. Uh, Tossie Aaron, Joan Baez, James Barto, June Carter, Johnny Cash was there. Yeah, with June. Oh. yeah, yeah. That was a nice. I mean, some of some some nights are more memorable than others. Dan and the Deacon, Alex Darling, Reverend Gary Davis, Hamza Eldin, Alex Dopkin, Dylan, Jack Elliott, Sam Eskin, Billy Fair, Mimi and Richard Farina, John Hammond, John Harold, Jesus De Jerez, Varda Carney, Eric Cass, Peter Lafarge, Alex <laughs> Lukeman, Sonia Malkin, Ed McCurdy, Jorge Morel, <laughs> Bill Oakes, Tom Paxton, Jean Redpath, Sabikas, Sarita, Juan Sastre, Frank Schilt, John Sebastian, Buffy St. Marie, Al Sutton and Sons, Happy and Artie Tron, Hetty West, John Wynn, Peter Yarrow. That's an and amazing list. That's crazy. It is. That's it crazy. Is. It is crazy. And and you know what it was back then? It was uh, it was very different than today. Uh, you just sat around and played music, and then somebody you know brings a guitar, and and before you knew it, you're jamming, and they're all playing their own song. And did you hear this? And uh, and it was just a musical night, even when there were no performances. So there was always music there, and. Uh, and uh, were there ever nights when you were like, "I'm done, I'm going to bed," you and Bernard, and people just stayed up anyway? Like, no, I'm always the last one okay. to bed. I'm the <laughs> last seconds. one to bed and the first one up. <laughs> Wherever <laughs> I am, it doesn't matter. Somehow, that's how it works. My other question, because I'm so familiar with the physical space, that recessed, you know, lowered patio space seems to me like wasted space right now. But it must have been very, I mean, you're right at sidewalk level. Like it must have just been so active out there. Was it very active very on active. that patio? Very active. I mean, I would see that, I would imagine that people would pull up their motorcycles and their this, you could watch everybody go by. Yeah. And it seems like such a vital space right now. It's very quiet space. right now, but, um, but did, did, did that happen? Could you see out the window and see people sort of walking by and everybody yeah, that was coming how down? I and to sit there and watch the people go the by. Dish, yeah. <laughs> That's the beauty. It's just like, you know, a very European cafe. I mean, can't you imagine that in Europe, like uh, Toulouse, Philip, Lake, and Van Gogh together at a cafe? Well, that's what the cafe was like. I mean, the food was excellent. Bernard was a great cook. Um, you were treated with respect. Uh, you had everything you want. The lighting was perfect. The music was always good. It was like, it was just a magnificent place to hang out. And then the people that would come in, I mean, you have all the artists of Woodstock. I mean, you know, like Archipanko and, uh, and Julio Di Diego and Fletcher Martin and uh, Refugee. All your artists would be there and they'd be intermingling and having conversations and there's a conversations of politics, you name it, uh, psychiatric, psychiatric uh, whatever. It was always interesting conversation. So it was, it was, a, it was a hangout and people just, uh, you, you always wanted to be there. You didn't want to miss a night because you'd go back a, the next night and find out Oh my God, Johnny Cash was there last night with June. Well, boy, aren't you annoyed that you didn't come down to the espresso. But that's how it was. You never knew who would pop in because there's always somebody that's going to join, you know, the, uh, the crew. 
So, uh, and I feel, I don't know, you know, like in retrospect, when I'm involved in it, while I was doing it, it was in a spot still, and I'm cooking, I got four kids, I have three and another one on the way, and I'm doing what I'm doing, keeping the restaurant together, everybody happy and all that. So it's not like, uh, wow, it's Bob Dylan. But in retrospect, it's like, wow. <laughs> you were busy, Mama. You were super wow. woman. You know, he dedicated this album to the Patcherells because we let him stay upstairs and stay with us. You know, like, it's like, wow, that's incredible. I mean, I'm in awe. Uh, I mean, I think, I don't know, I think Dylan is the poet, poet of the last century. I mean, he's got to be up there with Shakespeare and... Uh, and what he has to say in his words and his music. And I don't know anyone. His, his, his words are constantly in my brain, you know, every once in a while. It's like a passage comes out and I go, wow, you know, so uh, ahead of his time. I mean, he could just, you know, pick up a newspaper and he'd, ha he'd have a whole song. And, uh, and, you know, the Carter songs and all the people that, they, uh, that he, he sings about. It's just, uh, it blows me away that that I even, you know, was part of his life. I mean, I always say that the best years of my life were at the Espresso. I had my four kids. I had my last daughter, you know, Nina, and, uh, and Dylan, and, and everybody in there every night with music. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was heaven. It was, in, and it was great times. The quietness of it was great. During the winter. Yeah. Yeah, I preferred the winters. You preferred the winters. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. I prefer the winters. Uh, I mean, the summers were hectic, and you just, you know, were very busy. But yeah, I got to relax a little in uh, winter. Does anybody remember Theodore Sturgeon? Yes, yes. I do. Yeah, sci-fi. Uh, yeah, his, his. I think his wife is still in town. He yeah. did a she nice said, article. She did. Yeah, Marion, right? Marianne. Sturgeon. He did a nice uh, article when we first came to town on uh, the espresso. And then here's a little thing that was kind of. Uh, we we kind of all band together to try to get the photography center not to buy the uh, you know not to buy the cafe and not to change it over, but we weren't very successful. This uh, this paper was 1989, so if you think it does matter, you have one chance to make yourself be heard tonight. After tonight, it may be too late. The lobby is just the first step in the eventual elimination of the cafe by their landlord. The cafe is a precious resource and a long-standing tradition. It is allowed to be taken over. No place else will ever be able to take its place. Together with the Village Green, it is as close to being the very heart and pulse of Woodstock as anything can ever be. To replace even a part of the cafe with the lobby is just a na another nail in the coffin of Woodstock as we know it. Woodstock could never be the same without the special place. There is a public hearing about the lobby tonight, March 9th at 8 15 at the Como Town Office building. If you don't come someday, you may be sorry. And that's Ellen Barry, Leah Boss, Michael Esposito, Doug Every, Jim Newton, Joe Newton, Tony Parker, Ben Frivo, Rick Sanchez, Martha Sands, Rick Tompkins, Nancy Vareccio, Mike Winfield, David C. Woodstock. Uh, yeah, we tried, but it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't happen. So. But you know, it's because of the disability, the, uh, disability act. Yeah. Honestly, what's, what does that mean? The U.S. You know, when the U.S. Uh, government uh, passed the disability act uh, for the the uh, uh, photography center to get grants, they had to have a, an access for people in wheelchairs. Oh, so really? So is that that's, what is that? That's how it started. They got a small space. Uh, to have uh, access for shows on the sec on the first right. floor because they thought everything was going on upstairs oh, and people true. couldn't get up there. So to get grants, they had, they had, had to access. Exactly. So then they eventually well, that's a shame. took I, it over. I didn't realize that, but that makes that makes absolute sense. That's but you know what? The Longyear building, the building right on the corner here, was for rent at the time. The old bank. They that's where they that. should have bought. That would have been much better for them than down here off the beaten path. They would have been right in the center, the photography center, right there. Yeah. But Landlord, because of the two ladies who owned it, I guess. That's who knows? But you know. All the connections with uh, Greenberg, uh, Howard Greenberg. Yeah. 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 We used to uh, do some rehearsing of uh, 
what is now the center of photography. What were the two sisters or the two people who owned it? Right, I don't, I don't remember their names, but they owned this for a long time. Right, yeah. right. Anyway. Does anybody, has anybody heard Sebastian Cabot do Dylan? It's magnificent. Sing, sing, yeah, he's right. he, he's, he reads it. He, he reads it. Yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, his voice is so powerful. It's such a great uh, uh, record. And also, uh, Dylan had a record that I, have, I wanted to go to the music store and see if I can locate it, of orchestration of all his, of his songs. And that's pretty cool with a full orchestra that a lot of people probably don't realize they you know. What other sort of suggested reading and looking? I see you have a lot of things on the table. Well, I can't who are going to watch this video online. Yeah. Can you give them some ideas of things that they can go and look at? Well, my, my favorite. First of all, the album that's dedicated to you. Yeah, that's great, right? right? But my favorite, my favorite is this one that just came out by Douglas Gilbert, Forever Young. And, and the reason why it's one of my favorites, aside from the fact that I'm in there and my family, but it's, it's the Dylan of the 60s when he was relaxed and it's like it's not uptight and all the photographs in here are just so beautiful of him and how comfortable he was. Are there pictures of the cafe you know, in there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, at, he's at the cafe, yeah. Let's see the family table. Well, let me see if I find it. I'm going to show you my favorite one that we're all kind of laying out on the bed upstairs. When he was upstairs living with us, it was uh, we called it the white room. And we called it the white room because it was white. <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. And the high ceilings and beams, hewn beams, beams, and, uh, and picture window overlooking Tinker Street. What was Tinker Street before Tinker Street? Do you remember the street name? It wasn't Tinker Street. Hmm. It bothers me that I don't remember. But it's yeah. somewhere somebody will remember. This video. No, the world was down. Send us a comment at the let us know. Covered, but then what it was called. Yeah, it wasn't Tinker Street. But I don't remember what it was called. Here's my favorite picture because here's a picture of, uh, and, and Lloyd Gibson is in here. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that. But look how relaxed Dylan is. We're laying down on the bed. This is Gerard. This is Dylan's like favorite. He loves Gerard. This is me, and I'm pregnant for Nina. This is Bernard, John Sebastian, Mona. Forever Ray, Young. My older daughter. By Forever Young by Douglas Gil Gilbert. By Douglas and my sister Gilbert. Roseanne. That's a beautiful photo. Yeah. Look how happy and sweet. I know. He's this just is the one that he was doing this. Uh, a photo essay for Look Magazine. Right? He was doing it for Look Magazine, and they they didn't they didn't use publish, his right? he, they didn't publish it. So like 40 years later, his daughter says, "Why don't you do a book? You have all these great photographs." Right. And I'm so glad he did because Definitely. here is this book that now is a treasure. And uh, John Sebastian has you know he says a few words in it, and but most of them are taken like that was in the. I room wonder where Mr. Gilbert is now. He's if, around. If he's around. Then he's got a but place he's, and but a he's possible from the Midwest, yeah. He lives out. Oh yeah, he's not around the corner. He's right. Not, yeah. He's, this is like a little slice he's of history. He's around the planet. He's, he's on the planet. This is yeah. a little slice of history at a particular time. Yes. That that's what he took. He took a, a photo essay that was going to be in Look magazine. I know. And it didn't and he happen. Never made it. So and so made 40 years out. later, yeah. it becomes a. Yeah. Uh, here's Dylan hanging out with my daughter Monique in the back, you know, behind the espresso. And you know, he's there comfortable with them. And, uh, and he, this is when he's had his motorcycle and there's John. Is that the tricycle he got, Gerard? The tricycle, uh, yeah, his first tricycle. Dylan bought uh, Gerard his first tricycle. That's a cool story. Yeah, yeah. Here's I'd another, like to be able to say that. Here's another cute story is that, that, uh, that uh, my son spit his uh, scrambled eggs in Dylan's face. One day at the family table, we're having breakfast, and I guess I guess Bob is teasing Gerard, and uh, I'm waiting, you know, like to see what, you know, how far is Gerard going to let him go, and uh, and then it, it went as far as that. He finally did that, and Bernard was ready to strangle Gerard, but Dylan went, no, 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 it was my fault. I was, it's don't, no, no. <laughs> he stopped him, you know, quickly, and it's a good thing because I was ready to strangle Bob. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is uh, Bob and Allen Ginsberg up at uh, 
up at the Albert Grossman's. This is where he stayed when he wasn't uh, with us until he bought, then he bought his own place on Bird Cliff. But, but I, I think this is a great book. Uh, this is at the cafe. And uh, there's a lot of great books. I've, I've got, I, I, don't, I can't say I've got all Dylan's books, but I, I keep up with it because there's always, there's always a little blurb in, in some of the books that comes out. But I like this. I also like this book of uh, this is uh, this is Barry Feinstein and uh, Daniel Kramer and Jim Marshall. Right. And this is you know Barry Feinstein lives in town. It's called Early D Dylan. Yeah. And you have three separate uh, right uh, photographers. Photos. Say. Right. Oh, three separate. And that's one of my favorites. Like, Dylan. You know, look at his hands. That whole expression. It's, Daniel Kramer had a. Very yeah, popular. yeah. I, did, I didn't bring Daniel Kramer's book. I don't know why. I had it. I had it out, and I didn't bring it because there's some nice photographs of uh, next time. The nice photographs of uh, of Bernard shooting pool with Bob. But these are nice photographs. This this photograph I happen to know this one here that uh, Barry took of uh, Dylan in England, I believe. This will interest you, Barry. I don't even know if you know about. It. And I saw the video, it's kind of neat. Let me find a yeah, page. But anyway, it's a picture of Dylan, and he's out, He's on the steps with the whole, a whole bunch of kids behind him. And I think it was in England. I should just yeah, Barry was in England. But what they did was, here it is. What they did was, 30 some odd years later, they did a video of the grown-ups. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah Judy yeah. has it. Oh, yeah, I, I should that. I should ask her to bring it down, and maybe I can, you know, this could be part of the... I think that's pretty neat. To, that what a great cool. concept, 30 years later, can to see sure what... Uh, like that? Yeah, very cool. They, uh, so, these are nice photographs. I like very nice photographs. Yeah, very nice. Well, one of them was the, the, the opening for Scorsese's... Uh, uh, documentary right. It's right there. This is the one on the on the dock. Uh huh. With the, with the, near the car. That was Barry's. That's uh, Barry's. Yeah. yeah when was the right. last time you spoke to Dylan? Uh, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't call each other. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's easy for him. Somebody says, "Well, how come you're not in touch?" You know. Yeah. How come you know he does? You know, life moves him. on. And uh, part of no. Life I, moves on. No, I say, well, he could call me too. You know, I mean, <laughs> it works both ways. Yeah, it does work both ways. I have ways. a question. Where is the family table now? Does it still exist? The uh, table itself. Mean, do we we cut it up in pieces and, and bring it home with us. No, we left it there when we left the espresso. We left everything, you know, as as was. As was. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, the espresso was, uh, you know, first it was the nook, and then it became the espresso. But I can't take credit for the decor at the espresso. That was done by Bud Drake. That's the people who bought it. They opened it and they had it for a year. And they opened it at the, the bar. No, no, oh. after the nook. Oh, okay. the cafe espresso. They did the bar, beautiful wooden bar, and the, the fireplace, and so that credit goes to you know we just came in and made it work. But mm -hmm. the decor, the, the everything that was there was done by Bud Drake. So what's the year? Which was what, Pam what Copeland, year? sixty-two. We bought the year. Pam Copeland. Uh, Pam Copeland had it, yeah. Before you did. Well, her son, yeah, which she told me was her brother. I only found out, you know, <laughs> buddy, twenty years later. That's, that's very Woodstocky. It's, it's very Woodstocky. There's a whole story. new show on that one. Very. I remember that story. Well, sometimes <laughs> you you know somebody and you know this person and then you find out twenty years later they're related, they're brother and sister. <laughs> Billy Fair. I knew Marilyn, you know, and I knew Billy. But I didn't know they were brother and sister, and I knew each of them for 20 years. Yeah, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn uh, Peterson. Yes, yes. I knew Billy that. Fair's, she told me that. Billy Fair's uh, sister. I remember yeah. that. And another one is uh, Roz, uh, Roz oh, Roker and, Ron, and Ron, Ron, Ron Ray, Ray, right? I didn't know that either. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so Marilyn, Marilyn and uh, That speaks to the Billy individual. Fair's. Yeah. So... So this is the first draft of that. Uh, did I tell you about, or was I talking about that before? Before. Yeah, Vic, Victor Maymutis uh, was uh, Dylan's manager, 
and uh, he came through town in the, I don't know how long ago, 10 some odd years ago. And, um, and he said, let's, you know, do you want to write a book about Dylan, you know? And I said, sure. So, so he was going off to Hawaii and we made plans that I would do a first draft and he would do his first draft and then we'd meet and put it together and, uh, and maybe something will come of it. And then he went and died. Oh, and what was his name? Repeat that. Victor Mimutis. Yeah, he's in the uh, Forever Young. Yeah, there's oh. a nice picture. Of did he that. die in Hawaii? I think he did. I he hope died. so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah That's I a good place to die. Yeah. Okay. And these are just, you know, a lot of articles on uh, on the cafe that I save on my. Uh, so how long did you run the cafe? We had it from '62 to '66. And then we, uh, I'd still be there now, but, you know, Bernard got, you know, he just got tired of it. And uh -huh. was always ready to move on to something new. And, uh, and so he painted this beautiful picture of selling the cafe and going to France for a year, spending a year in France, and the children would learn how to speak French. And uh, so it sounded like, you know, it did sound very nice. And so that's what we did. We sold the cafe and went to France, and three months later we were back home. <laughs> I was homesick. We were broke. Nothing was happening over there. And with four hippie children in France, you know, from the <laughs> south of France to the north of France, we go back and forth. You know, he's looking for work, and it's like, help. And then finally I said, just dump me. I had my family was in Italy, in Rio Maggiore, and I had him dump me and the four kids in Rio Maggiore while he went all around looking for work. And uh, then we... Nice place to be done. Yes, it was a very nice place. I don't know if you know Rio Maggiore. It's, it's one of Cinque Terre. It's a town that, that goes around. There's five small little gems of towns. And you walk from the Via La Morte, they call Lover's Lane. You can walk from one town to the next. It's a magnificent, magnificent place. Yeah. Good food. And do you have any other anything you want to hear about? How are we doing on time? Okay. I mean, some of the memorable uh, nights uh, that, that you remember? That well, time? I can give you one of my favorite nights there at the uh, cafe, and that's the, uh, that's, uh, I guess, I guess it's the uh, 64, and Nina's probably a couple of months old. She was born July 3rd, so she's a couple of months old. And so I'm, it was a summer night? Um, a summer night, yeah, and I'm upstairs, and, uh, and, in the uh, what we call the gray room that was next door to the room that right. Dylan lived in, because it was gray. It was called <laughs> the gray room. Right. And uh, yeah. and the funny thing about it, uh, I don't know if you know Bud Seif, who had the Sled Hill Cafe. He was a, uh, uh, you know, a, I want to say architect, but no, he was a, like, whatever he was. But uh, he said, let's insulate the uh, with a crates. So that's what we did, which is kind of cool. If you ever need That's insulation, a crates. We had those big a crates that we got, you know, for the cafe, and some of them were purple. So we had this whole gray with them. And once in a while, there was purple. It was really neat. It was kind of cool. So I'm sitting around the stove pipe that came in from the uh, center of the uh, cafe up into the gray room, and I'm sitting there with my feet up on the on the uh, where the stove pipe is. And do uh, you remember that? And I'm in a rocking chair and I'm nursing Nina. And all of a sudden, I hear the house of the rising sun. And there's downstairs is Dylan and uh, Joan Baez, her sister, Richard Farina, Jack Elliott, Billy Fair, Sonia Malkin, John Sebastian. I don't know who else, but you know, like a whole slew of people. All saying that. And, you know, it's such a shame that we couldn't have a tape recorder, yeah. like, you know, be there to capture that. Because you're never going to hear it, the House of the Rising Sun like that again. Did you take the baby and go down, or did you just listen? No, I just stay. Are you kidding? I, I thought I died and went to heaven. I was there, you know, like, and the music is just coming into yeah. my ears. It's just, no, I didn't have to go down and look at them. It was, you know, enough just to hear them. So that's um, like uh, August uh, and 64? Yeah, probably like in August. Yeah, because she was just a couple of months. So she was wow. just born. So... Uh, yeah, but you know, every night was memorable in a sense. I mean, that's a little, a little special, like you know, like 
like Johnny Cash coming in with June Carter, that makes it even a little, even though every night is memorable, that made it even, you know, a little more. And sitting out on the terrace, and they would play like for hours, and you could see people going up and just hanging out, listening. It was so casual then. You know, we don't have that anymore. Everything's so formal and so so proper. You know, then there was nothing proper. It was just, you know, everything was proper. It was just not proper, you know? It was like, you know, it was more like hanging out and, you know, come on in. If you compare the different places, like Dini's was very proper at that time, right? Everyone went there for desserts or dinners and stuff. Yeah. And the Joyous Lake was very dirty in a way. You know, it was... Uh, it was a whole. It was funky. Right, right. Funky. Okay. Okay. Funky. I mean, not, I don't mean dirty. I know. In well, the, that's what it sounds like when you say dirty. But right. funky. No, that is a, funky. Yeah, it was a very yeah. uh, different than you, which is a really uh, right. family in yeah. a way, but and more relaxed uh, situation. Yeah. Well, it's true. That's what I guess cafes are called, cool cafes. But you know, Dini's as proper as Dini's was. You could walk in there because Dini's had white tablecloths. Right. You could walk in there and have a cup of coffee, and you're going to get a white tablecloth. There, there was no, there was no, you know, separation of Dini's. Anybody was, you know, uh, welcome. welcome. Right. Yeah, he was. Right. He was a pro at that. They had the best raspberry miniature tarts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, Dini's, Dini's was very special, and he was a very professional, wonderful. Restaurateur. Did Woody Guthrie ever play a famous person? Woody. Woody Guthrie? No. Was that before he comes in? Yeah, yeah, he just, died. yeah, he was already dying when, uh, when, you know, Dylan. by the time yeah. Dylan came to, uh, yeah, by the time Dylan came to. Dave Van Rump, did he ever come? Dave Van Rump must have come through, and uh, somehow I have no recollection. I, I feel like, you know, but Billy would know better. I'd like, you know, Billy's the person that needs to be part of this, uh, because he's got, you know, we were there kind of together, and uh, he's got a lot of, uh, and he was a musician, and he knew, he brought a lot of the people that I, I rattled off the list were brought up by Billy Fair. Uh -huh. I used to teach meditation in San Quentin prison, so I was curious about Johnny Cash. What was he like? He was great. I mean, you know, he was Johnny Cash. Was Johnny Cash was very, you know, there's no getting intimate with him. He's only there for dinner and playing music and talking, you know, so I don't really know. I didn't really know him. I, we went out, I went to the city. We went, I remember we went to Club 54. Was that that big club? And uh, he had to have a tie, and they turned us away, and we thought that was funny. I don't know where we wound up, but with Johnny Cash and Dylan. And he didn't have a tie, so he couldn't go out. No, he didn't have a tie. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of memorable nights. It's like they, they all fuse into the, you know, one fuses into the other. It's almost like one continuous <laughs> memorable night. Yeah, you were night. working, you know? Yeah, I'm working, but I'm having a good time. I can, you know, mix the, uh, you know, you do what you have to do. And you have, you know, but you said there was more than music. There were also discussions on psychoanalysis. Well, there, was always, there was always interesting conversations because you had <laughs> interesting people. You know, and uh, and you know, it wasn't only filled with uh, with Dylan. There was uh, some incredible nights with Julio Di Diego, an artist who made paella. He came and cooked paella for us. And Sabicas was at the Playhouse, and they came. Sabicas and said, uh, came down and uh, had dinner at the cafe that Julio. So that's a memorable night. Also, they were an all Dylan memorable nights. There were a lot of nights with uh, the artists. Yeah, the artists and. Uh, Writers. And the what? Writers. Artists and writers. And writers and poets and uh, Eric. Uh, do you remember Eric with the, with the camera around his neck and he had very thick glasses? I'd love to locate him. He must have photographs of the cafe that no one has. Does anyone know Did his surname? Ficht. We must find F-I-C-H-T-E. Eric Ficht. And I wish we could locate him because if you cut, if you locate him, he's got he took pictures every night, uh -huh. every night. I'm sure he's got all kinds of pictures. He's the only one that had a camera. You know, I have one picture. You know that my father-in-law took of me and Joan at the uh, at the uh, at the cafe. 
this one. And that's the only picture I had back, you know, back then that uh, that exists because you just didn't take pictures, you know. If, if anybody no, you were living there, it. You weren't looking at it. Yeah, and then what if, a cute and picture. Then if you were taking pictures, uh, he probably wouldn't want to be there if I had a tape recorder. None of that yeah. would have happened. That's so, uncool. so a lot of it, yeah. And what she's doing is she's writing out a check. This is a blouse that I hand wove because I had the atelier after Dylan lived there. We opened a gallery, and this is a hand-woven blouse, and she's writing me a check for it, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So the white room you had you were at? The white room, yeah. It was a gallery. I had the gallery, and I had the first show in George Valkeen in my gallery. I'm proud about that. Yeah. And uh, had we sold jewelry, and uh, we had a sandal maker there making belts and sandals, and uh, we had pottery and uh, paintings. and. Yeah, it was a great place. And, uh, I'm a weaver. I don't know how many of you know that, but I've been weaving for 30 years. Of course, my weaving days were over. How did you get along with your neighbor, Dan Leonard and the juggler? Yeah, they were all fine. I mean, yeah, we were all very comfortable with each other. Yeah, the shops were different then. You know, more, more, uh, more creative shops with handmade stuff than right. today. The real I mean, I, all the shops were, were handmade. I don't think there were any, uh, Happy you know, very, very few. Hi. Hi. Are they serving you coffee? No, we're not open. We're just doing a, oh. uh, that's okay. All right, thanks. Was eating out more accessible to artists? Because today we have 47 million people on food stamps, and I find in Manhattan artists can't afford to eat out. I don't know. In, in those days, it was accessible? I don't know. I, if you know, I, I guess in those days you didn't even think about eating out and whether anybody had money or, and right. who was homeless. I don't. I don't think homeless was even in our. You know, when did that start? Maybe in the seventies when family opened at the, the festival or something. But I mean, I can't. I can't imagine or think about how. What I was that just. Was like. I was just thinking about the nice conversations that you yeah. had around a table that people. Yeah, no, I don't ever remember any of those kind of conversations, but, uh, you know, so just do put I'm curious about the food. Yeah, what do you want to know about it? What was, like, the thing that everybody came in for besides coffee? Onions. The onion soup was Onion soup popular. with the cheese on top? And the mm -hmm. onion soup mm -hmm. in the crock with the cheese right. on top. Nobody's made it. I don't, I haven't had onion soup like that. You know, we used to do it at the bear. Even Eric doesn't do it as well. And he should, because he certainly had the recipe. But, um, well, we'd have like rack of lamb, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for two. We'd have, um, I, we'd have, uh, well, I mean, I sometimes I would cook and I would do uh, you know, something different. Like, uh, well, I would do paella or I'd do, uh, I'd do a, um, uh, chicken cacciatore, whatever, whatever, you know, every now and then I would just make a, a dish for the night on the specials. What was and the poor man's dish when they came in and they really just right, wanted to sit and hang out? Yeah. Like, what would they just get? Just like a cup of coffee and a croissant? Or would it be, you know, was there something that was really delicious you know, and I really affordable? Really, I can't really even tell you what that, you know, that there's a poor man in there. Nobody was poor. There were no poor men. I mean, well, maybe you just didn't have much money, so you came in. Like, Alex would only get a cup of coffee. You didn't yeah. have much money. But you didn't think of it like oh, rich right. and poor. No, or, I understand. I'm just, yeah, I, I guess what I'm asking is, if I, was, if I didn't have much money and I wanted to sit and be with all of you, what would I order? A cup you of coffee. A cup of coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Fried yeah. onions. Yeah. Yeah. Fried onions. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. Right. And you get a an oval dish, I think that's where it was, right on us, and you have several people who are drinking beer and nibbling on the onions. Okay. Yeah. Because Bernard was a good cook, wasn't he? He was a good cook, yeah. He definitely was a good cook. So this is this is a uh, one night at the uh, cafe uh, where Dylan and Joan were, and probably a winter night and nothing happening. And we had paper on the table, and she did a she did a drawing, which was very good. She's very good of Dylan, 
and he did one of her and then they did one of each other and themselves and so it's uh, these are precious little gems and uh, I took this one and in 19 I don't know what year this is and I wanted to do an embracing Dylan kind of like just to you know thank him for everything he's done for Woodstock in general and uh, I still want to do it. It didn't come to pass. It didn't happen. But uh, I had ten prominent musicians perform the music of the American master Bob Dylan of oh, Saturday, 1999, at the Bears Hole Theater. So I still hope to do this someday. And uh, well, this we will, will be, sponsor you. Yeah, this will be the uh, this will be the poster because I think that you know says it all. We'll do it up at Bird. Pardon? We'll do it up at Birdwood in the barn. We could do it in the barn. We could do it at the Bearsville Theater. We could do it. We can do it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it in the road. He's a cute little uh, Peter Rokoff. Uh, he, he used to do cards for a Hallmark. He made that of the Patcherels. I think it's kind of cute. <laughs> but you know, like that's what would happen. You know. Uh, Mary, you said Rokoff or Rakoff? Rakoff. 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 Because I have a story with him. As far as Peter Rakoff, yeah, right? Peter not Rakoff. Peter, not from IBM, not from uh, Rotron. Oh, he's Rakoff. Yes. Then this is Rokoff. Oh, okay. And so maybe it's not even Peter. I forget. R A K O V E. Yeah, R A K. Not at that. What's that? Rakoff did not do cards. No, that was yeah. from. Uh, he's from um, Rotron. Right. Peter, that Peter. Mm -hmm. This is another, this is Rokoff, and I'm not even sure that's his first because name. Because Peter Rokoff from, I thought it was like, yeah, but Rokoff, whatever, yeah. came to see our production of uh, Harold Pinter's The Birthday Party, mm -hmm. and it was in the days when Pinter was not understood, you know, the way Beckett wasn't understood, and Peter Rokoff was there, and he looked, and he came out, and he said, I don't understand anything. All I know, I enjoyed it, but I don't know what it means. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what it's all about. Think of, you know, how old Pinter and what, what happened. Do you remember La Mama? La Mama? Yeah. Is that going on at the same time that you were? Oh, well, La Mama in New York City. In New York City. Yeah. We actually, it seems to me, there was several Holly by plays. Oh, no, it wasn't La Mama. It was the Capiccolo. And we had produced it here, and then they took it to the Cabrillo in New York City. We did a lot of original scripts until we got highly burnt. We did a show that we thought was going to be fabulous about a rabbit that comes out of the ground, and it was going to be therapeutic, I don't know, all kinds of things. We thought the ending of the play was so good, and we made a, we put a hole in the ground, and we did it. It was a flop, and we lost our shirt. And from then on, it became a little more problematic as to the way we handle new scripts. So we've done new ones, actually, but not so many original. We did Bill C. Davis' General Catapult. We did Charles Dumas. Um, no, also, anyone, one of them, Bill C. Davis, I guess it was. No, it wasn't. It was Charles Dumas did a play called Touchdown. And it was made into a motion picture with a change of name, etc. We did a lot of originals that became a deal. So, anything else you want to know? I'm also a writer. <laughs> I'm a writer. <laughs> we so I, de I, declared, I declared myself a writer in 1976 when I bought myself an electric typewriter. <laughs> and I said, that's it. I am now a writer, and I've been writing ever since. <laughs> but I, I was with the Woodstock Originals. I don't right. know if uh, it was a uh, Professor Keith ran the class, and it was up in the, up in the barn, in Berkeley Barn. With the Petersons, was, yeah. With the Petersons. They were a great couple. And, um, and we did the first one. I'm not in this because I was busy at the Bear Cafe at the time, so I couldn't make the shoot. Otherwise, I would have been there. And uh, and uh, Joe Thomas, she's in she here also. She was a writer. Right. Her sister, it's a beautiful, thing. beautiful writer. Oh really? I didn't know Joe Chalmers. Thomas. Her sister, sister yeah. was married to Phil Gustin. Phil Gustin. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. What's her? She was. What's her name? Uh, 
Well, Joel Chalk, Musa, Musa, Musa. 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 I knew her daughter, right? I knew their daughter, Musa Mega. Yeah. Right. She was. So, so when did the Woodstock Originals publications sort of, what well, they the inception and, and the this demise? Is, I Look, I have my winning lottery tickets in here. <laughs> nice, what'd you win? I don't know, I'm gonna go check. <laughs> my mind. I might have $100,000 in this pocket. <laughs> or more. In the early 80s. Right? <laughs> early 80s. Was Woodstock Originals? Um, 1984. This is when this came out. Who was responsible we, for the publication of that? We, um, uh, I think we're clip. Uh, the Canal the guild Press. Board. The Guild. Okay. The Guild. See, there's they another thing. It, I think. Yeah. Designed by Judith. I think we did ourselves. I don't know what we did. Yeah. We well, the Petersons did it. Uh, yeah. 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 And, uh, and there's a 